All right. So now that we've talked about this basic pattern from going from receptors through the thalamus into the primary sensory cortex, secondary sensory cortex, up to the association cortices, we're going to be talking about how this works specifically in the visual system. And please do pay attention to this pathway because we will use this organization when we also uh, examine the other senses such as hearing and sense of smell and touch. So one of the first things that helps us figure out a little bit more about how complex perception is, is perceptual illusions. So we can see things that are not really there. So this is a really good example. I'm going to go through a couple of these. But here, when you look at this information, okay, you can, most of you have all seen this, what is seen, what is perceived by people is these, the, these two facial profiles. And of course, if you try, you can also, if you're not perceiving the two facial profiles, you are perceiving a vase or a pedestal of some kind. What is important is that you cannot actually perceive both of those representations at once. This is a really good example of how perception is directly related but is very very distinct from sensation. The two ways that we could perceive this are competing, that you can't have both of them at the same time. This is either uh, this two facial profiles um, maybe in front of a window or something like that or it is a lamp and so it is not advantageous for our brain to actually be able to see both of them at one time. So what happens instead is that if you look at it and you try to think of it as one or another, the image will slightly shift in your mind in terms of what it is. Here's another example of a perceptual illusion. People when they look at this tend to think that this line here is longer than this one and when you look at it, it really does appear to be the case that this line right here appears or is perceived to be slightly longer than this line here. In actuality, they are exactly the same. Another type of perceptual illusion is this here, that when you look at this, you see that this looks like it's spinning and moving. In actuality, it's not. This is not some sort of weird like video trick I'm playing or anything like that. This is just the way that your brain perceives the particular, the particular sensory information that is currently in front of it. Here's another example of perceptual illusion. Uh, I can ask you all what is it that you perceive when you look at these particular shapes and typically the answers range from I see a triangle in front of another triangle. I see Pac-Man. I see a triangle in front of circles. I see lines on a page, you know. So all of this is stuff that is perceived. What is actually there is literally just differences in color and the shapes we assign meaning to them. That something is in front of something or behind of something. So just as I said earlier, perception is assigning meaning to sensory information. So here, when we look at this, we tend to assign meaning that these, that here we have a triangle that might be in front of these three circles. And by being in front of it, it's blocking the rest of these circles. So we might interpret that there is actually still uh, a full circle behind this. Here's another example of perceptual illusion, and you're going to actually have a participation question that is posted in regards to this. So take a moment to look at this painting and try to find how many faces are in this painting. So you can pause here as long as you want when you get to this point uh, in the video and you can count them up. There will be a participation question posted when this video is posted. The participation question will ask you to report how many faces you see in the painting on slide 11. And so that is this painting. So pause this as you will and take count of how many. I'm not going to talk about it here. Suffice it to say that there are quite a few. And so you'll be able to see from the variable responses made by your peers 
um, how many you see versus how many your peers see. Related to this example is when we see clouds that look like things, um, we say, oh, a cloud looks like a duck or something like that. So we are assigning meaning to this visual information. Now, we're able to perceive the information that we do based upon the functional anatomy of the visual system. Vision is our primary sensory experience. We rely on it very, very heavily. Uh, far more of the human brain is dedicated to vision than any other sense, and this is not true for every organism. The rat brain, for example, has a huge olfactory system relative to ours. So animals, even if they do have a high level of visual acuity, uh, they'll oftentimes have variable balances across their sensory systems. So as humans, we are highly, highly reliant on vision where a rat, for example, could be reliant both on vision and smell. Uh, dogs, for example, can be reliant on both hearing and smell, so they have an overrepresentation of those in the brain. But for humans, understanding the visual system's organization is really key to understanding human function, human brain function. Because we're so reliant on uh, the visual system, it is particularly important to understand how we process visual information. So one of the important things to know is that the information that we perceive in the world, um, it's right side up, and then when we actually perceive it, it flips upside down on our fovea. And so one of the things that our brain does is actually, in part of processing, it will write this information right side up. But these are some of the various parts of the eye. We'll come back to this in a, in a subsequent slide. We'll talk more about the various parts of the eye. But here's the optic nerve. Here's the fovea. This is a blind spot. This right here is the retina. It's this whole portion right here that goes all the way across the eye. The lens and the cornea. The lens focuses information. The cornea is what you would modify if you were having some of this eye surgery so that you don't need contact, contact lenses anymore, stuff like that. So the visible light that our eye perceives is just a fraction of the electromagnetic energy that exists in the world. So the range of electromagnetic the, the range of electromagnetic energy that is visible to humans is basically about 400 nanometers, which is the violet um, end of the spectrum, to 700 nanometers, which is the red end of the spectrum. And we perceive the shortest visible wavelengths as deep purple, and then as wavelength increases, the color morphs from violet to blue to green to yellow, orange, red, and aside from uh, this, the uh, wavelengths that are visible to us, we have gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. Butterflies and honeybees, they detect light in ultraviolet range, so they actually have a broader perspective spectrum of color and so the visible light that we perceive from the 400 to the 700 nanometers is a really good example of a receptive field so we can only sense information that falls within that range. We're going to go through some of the basic points of the eye okay so the sclera forms the eyeball the white of the eye the cornea is the eye's clear outer covering, and the colored iris opens and closes to allow more or less light. This is, would be the pupil, sort of the pupil dilation. And the lens then in turn focuses the light. The cornea and the lens of the eye act like a camera. They focus light rays to project uh, a backward inverted image of a light receptive, on a light receptive surface. So, in an early camera, of course, the light receptive surface would be film, and for our eyes, the light receptive surface is the retina. So in the retina, light energy initiates neural activity. So the photoreceptor cells are in the retina. So the retina is where the visual energy from the, or the light wave energy from the environment is converted into neural energy for your brain to interpret. And here, this back 
area right here, you have an optic disc, which is basically a blind spot. So this is an example actually of your retina. So if you take this sort of retina section back here, you can see this is what the retina would look like. Um, this is the surface of it. So you can see the blood vessels that would bring blood. They would cover the retina because even all the cells around here are going to need uh, are going to need uh, oxygen and nutrients. So this point here where they have the least amount of blood vessels, this actually represents the fovea, and this is where you have your highest amount of visual acuity. Where these blood vessels come in, this is refers to a blind spot because there are no receptors there. So there are no receptors that process this light energy from the environment. So everyone, we don't realize it, but everyone technically has a blind spot. And there's a couple of things you can do to find your blind spot. You can look it up on YouTube if I'm not able to post any. So to tell you a little bit more and review some of the definitions, the cornea has is the clear outer covering. The iris opens and closes to allow more or less light in. And the iris is also colored. The hole in the iris is called the pupil, so your pupil would dilate to let light in. The lens focuses the light. It bends to accommodate near and far objects. And then you have your retina, where the light energy initiates neural activity. So this is where all of your photoreceptor cells are. And again, um, I'm going to re just returning to this picture here. These are your ciliary muscles. And these are also the muscles that are used to focus the lens. And your lens over time actually becomes stiffer. And this is why you can often need glasses as you age, because you're not able to focus as much. And we've covered most of this, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this slide. So what we're going to be talking more about is the retina, where the photoreceptor cells are. So the retina is a light-sensitive surface at the back of the eye consisting of neurons and photoreceptor cells. What the retina does is it encodes the information, so it translates light into action potentials. It also discriminates different wavelengths, so it allows us to see color, and it works in a wide range, it works in a wide range of light intensities. So we can see in dim light and we can see in bright light. The fovea is the region at the center of the retina that is specialized for high acuity. This region uh, at the center is specialized for high acuity, and there are two main reasons. Okay, and we'll be and I'll be talking a little bit more about why uh, you have highest visual acuity in the fovea in, in the next couple of slides. And then again, I also mentioned that everybody has a blind spot. So the region of the retina known as the optic disc, this is where axons forming the optic nerve leave the eye and where blood vessels enter and leave. So this region has no photoreceptors, it has no rods and cones, so it cannot actually perceive or cannot actually sense any information from the environment in the blind spot. So here's the structure of the retina for humans, okay? This is actually the back of the eyeball, so the light is going to come through here. And so the light actually passes through all these cells up front here, and then it reaches these receptor cells in the back that correspond to particular color and light intensities. And then you have these horizontal cells and bipolar cells that will begin to combine the encoding or the neural activity from these receptor cells. and they will then pass that information here to these retinal ganglion cells. And the retinal ganglion cells, they form your optic nerve. And again, remember that a nerve is basically a collection of axons. So all right here are axons that are forming the optic nerve. So later on down the line, if you were to cut your optic nerve, then you would no longer be able to see. Okay, so here is the fovea. The fovea, again, remember, is that high point of visual acuity in your eye, so it's right back here. This is where you have the highest discrimination. So you have the highest discrimination in this area for two reasons. One, it's a rod-free area, okay? So you have mostly cones 
in your fovea and cones are really sensitive to differences in color so this is where uh, visual acuity you can have the highest sensitivity to slight differences in color importantly the other reason that you have high visual acuity is that in the fovea you don't have see how and this is also the retina over here retina over here these outer sides and again all of this is your retina all of this it's a whole big area right here but then your fovea is just this point in the middle where you have the highest visual acuity and again all of this over here would be the stuff that you see sort of out of the corner of your eyes but here where you're focusing you have this high visual acuity so not only do you have high cones here but then when the light comes in it also does not have to pass through as much as all of um, as much of the bipolar and uh, amacrine and retinal ganglion cells that eventually make up your optic nerve. So the light can go directly to the photoreceptor cells and none of it is lost as it passes through these bipolar cells.